Here we go, y'all. We're back for part three of our Basics to Becoming an Elk Hunter series. If you're looking to hunt elk for the first time, or even if you've hunted elk and you've been feeling overwhelmed with all the information that's out there, the goal of this series is to keep it as simple as possible. Up next, Basics on When to Hunt, Tactics Simplified, Response and Closing the Deal Basics, Shot Placement and Dealing with Success, all simplified. So, my friends, pull up a chair, adjust your volumes just right, and welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting, brought to you by ElkGrows.com, with your host, Gilbert Ornelas, and elk hunting coach, Joe Gilly. You want to hunt elk? They live to hunt elk. Their goal is to share with you what they have learned grinding it out for over 35 seasons, doing what they love. So come on into camp and set a spell. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunters. Hello there, everyone. If it's your first time with us, glad to have you. Hope you enjoy our show. And as always, for those blue collar hunters following our show and grinding it out with us every week, welcome back to Elk Camp. I'm Gilbert Ornelas, the host of your show, coming to you, as you can see, from my vehicle at said undisclosed location, beautiful Toledo Bend, Louisiana, that's for sure. Uh, and joining me tonight, we got the full crew. We got the leader of the Venezuelan Mafia. That's right, Mr. Luis Gonzalez, the world elk champion, world elk calling champion, Mr. Travis O'Shea is in the house. And <laughs> R.C. Knox, that's right, the legend from Cuesta, New Mexico. And we got Joe Gillia, WWJGD, and the ninja Leroy Champ Chavez in the house tonight with us from Cimarron, New Mexico. What's been up, fellas? Yeah. What's up, guys? Hey, I think it's stuff. so awesome, man. For for the people that are listening and can't see you, Gil, you, Gilbert is in his truck um, set up with this phone, and that's why he sounds like 1960s radio. <laughs> <there, man. laughs> awesome. <laughs> so, so one thing is I don't think Gilbert has ever – Honestly, dude, I don't think you've ever missed a podcast, man. I don't think that's not going to either. Yeah. And uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, some of the places I remember one time you were parked outside a convenience store. And people were like <laughs> Walmart parking lot too. One time, I think I'm, I'm in the Sabine State Bank and Trust Company parking lot right now. Oh, you're going to yeah, have looking to pretty, looking pretty suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> I got, yeah. I got me and I got me and my 21 foot skeeter behind me. Uh, they, they know it's this is a fishing community up here. So I don't stick out like a sore thumb. I just kind of blend in. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Man. Awesome. Very so, odd. so, uh, uh Travis, Travis, I wanted to start tonight by saying thank you so much, brother. I got oh, my yeah. care package and uh, dude, <laughs> nice. those things yeah, are same here. Phenomenal. Thank you, same here. thank you, phenomenal, yeah. Thanks, Travis. Phenomenal what, call. Guys. What care package That's... would that be, dude? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go, Chav. Show it to him, my guy. <laughs> <laughs> Chav had a <laughs> well, that's actually the prototype. And uh, in fact, there's a question on tonight's mailbox yeah. that one of our mm -hmm. people asked, when is the sugar going to be available? Well, the sugar is being packaged and sent here directly. Uh, so it's um, we're already going to start selling it in the store. Um, by the time this comes out, there's a good chance we already have the sugar in the store. If it's not in the store, we're taking the pre-orders as soon as uh, they roll in here. As soon as Travis, man, Travis has just been, <laughs> you've been working your butt yeah. off of it, man. Yeah, we've been putting miles on just traveling uh, show season, I guess. So it's... <laughs> Yeah. And then you go to a show and then you come home and you build, build, build. So, <laughs> yeah. So, as soon mm -hmm. as those puppies roll in, um, they're available. They're going to be there. So, we're going to be have the two signature calls. We're going to have the sugar. We're going to have the grinder. You're going to have the closer. You're going to have the one that's going to pull them in. Uh, man, it's, uh, we're, we're real excited about that. In fact, I think you're actually selling those at the show up in Edmonton this weekend, right? Yeah. I got just a handful for the show. And uh, it's not their, correct tape because like you know they did send us the wrong tape but uh it's black ink on the white so right. we're getting close yep. and the teal 
the teal is being printed as we speak right now. So that's All awesome. Right. Awesome. Yeah. So something else I wanted to talk about, y'all, that's happening right now is the <laughs> Hunt with the Elk Bros giveaway. Hello? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just think it's unfair. Anything. We can't participate, I, I man. Agree. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, agree. I agree with you. I asked him yesterday, can I, I get it. in this? No, man, he won't let us. <laughs> he won't How let unfair us is that? <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> It's kind of like the it's kind of like the hunt wars deal. They don't let us participate, man. Other than exactly. being the coach, yeah. man. They don't let us hunt, man. Yeah, yeah. We come in there. We come in there and knock it out the park, baby. Well, yeah. what good is it going? What good is it going to be for an elk bros coach to win to hunt with the elk bros? <laughs> it's it's going to be great. It's going to be it has great. been. We're going to show all the stuff. Yeah, it has been great. <laughs> you should have put more in. I mean, I, I, I want I want all of our listeners to know this, and and y'all, you know, Big O likes to embellish a few things, but I'm not going to embellish here. You have better odds drawing in our giveaway than any other odds drawing in New Mexico at a lower These cost, odds are at a much lower cost. Yep. So I would I would suggest every one of our listeners out there, if you want to elk hunt in New Mexico. With our crew, with the baddest cats in the land, y'all better get on that giveaway. It starts real soon. Joe, give them a date when it starts, brother. It's already started, bro. It's running. It's running oh, gotcha. right now. Okay, good deal. Yes, sir. Good deal. That giveaway is running. And we've got, we don't have, like last year, we had one giveaway winner for the package, right? <laughs> there ain't right. one package this year. <laughs> there ain't two packages. There ain't three packages. We got six <laughs> packages this year of Bye. all kinds of incredible prizes. <laughs> I mean, we've put some stuff together. When I say package, and we kind of went down all the way down to six, there's something hot in every one of these. But Bye. we start with the grand prize. Man, the grand prize, you know, and I, I you know, I keep trying to figure out what it is that the people are going to want most out of this grand prize. And I was like, is it to hunt with the elk bros? Is it that bow hitch? Because bow hitch is hot. Bow hitch is hot. I mean, that oh, no might, you know, no that's pretty hot. Or is it that somebody might want a $28,000 overland camper? You know, I'm like, no. What am I? No. What is no. <laughs> what you were, what you Joe, were saying? Yeah. Joe, we had a, a new listener uh, that's been. Uh, around me a bunch over the last 20 years that helps us with this tournament up here at Toledo Bend. His uh, name is Jeff Kessler, and he texted me the other night, and he goes, dude, which one of the calls do I need to start with? And also, how do I enter in that? I'm like, dude, you got you to gotta try and enter, Jeff. Jeff, this is going to be one of – he's going to go on his first elk hunt up in, New Me- in Wyoming on the first uh-huh. – first of september and i think i said jeff you're gonna have to take off the whole month if you win the other giveaway he goes i know that'll suck won't it have to take off the whole month to go help just terrible he he goes i'm i'm wondering well he's he said i'm wondering is the bow hitch really really what it's cracked up to i'm like so quick question how does someone enter it's real easy, man. Um, all you got to do is go to elkbros.com. Right there on the front page of ours is going to be a place where you can click to go over and and in right into the entries and read all of what's going on, how to enter. But to enter, you're going to go to that page. It And if you want the, the site, it's going to be elkbros.com slash hunt2023. Elkbros.com slash hunt hunt 2023 Uh, one word all right and once they go there it tells you exactly how to enter in order to get an entry into this giveaway you have to first of all either buy the academy our base camp online elk hunting course for yourself or somebody else once you enter once you purchase (laughs) that academy using the link that's on that page it's an automatic entry into that okay then for any or every academy that you buy, base camp that you buy for somebody else, we have gift cards on the page there, you get an entry per that as well. Now, but understand this, once you enter by either purchasing the base camp for yourself or somebody else, 
then for every $50 you spend in our store, you get an additional entry. Now think about that, man. Like Gil sure. was talking about, think about the people putting in for the lottery to get a tag in New Mexico to be able to hunt here. Now, first of all, you're going to have to buy the small game license, $68. You're going to have to yep. buy the habitat stamp for 11 Then you're going to have to buy your um, other stamp that's for $4. So now you're already up to $80 for that. And you have to front the money for the tag right on the, when you purchase, right? You can put in for $75, you can purchase our base camp online elk hunting course, which is going to help you become a better elk hunter, or you're going to purchase it for somebody. What a gift to give somebody else knowledge to help them become better elk hunters. That's going to enter you into this and you can get more than one entry. It's the best odds you can get to be able to get a hunt. Now, if you, I, I don't know that hunting with us is all that attractive. <laughs> <laughs> After some of the things we've been talking about before we were on the air. <laughs> but no, so, so whoever wins that, okay? Now here's the deal. Here's the packages. Package one, the grand prize is the New Mexico Archery Elk Hunt with the Elk Bros. A $28,000 Overland Elk Bros Edition camper by Drifter Trailers. Our buddy Steve at Drifter Trailers is, I, I, I just cannot believe, and I'm so overwhelmed and so humbled by Steve and what he's done in wanting to do this and partner with us to do this. That's how much he believes in what we do. And that makes this, that makes this whole thing even, I mean, I just shake my head. So we got the camper. Then we have from Western Fly, we have a Western Fly pack in optics covers. We have the Wapiti River Champion Hunt Pack, man, that is consisted of not just calls, not just grunt to. It's got call holders. It's got it's got scent checkers. It's, it's an incredible kit that <clears throat> our buddy here has uh, put into the into the mix. <laughs> and is that your new grunt too, Trap? Yep, yep, that's the new one. Yep. Yeah, um, we've got Absolutely. that. We've got the Elk Rose Edition Bow Hitch. We've got the Native by Carlton Call Pack. We've got the Slayer Enchantress Call. And I don't know if you guys have seen the Enchantress, but this is an external call, unlike anything I've seen, and makes some really great sound. So if you struggle with diaphragms or you don't want to have that in your mouth the whole time, you ought to check out this Enchantress. It's awesome. And because it's an elk hunt, they're going to get an Ultimate Predator elk decoy. They're going to get an Elk Bros buckle made by that man, the legend, R.C. Knox, <laughs> that they're going to be wearing while they're there. They're going to get a Tracy Henry original knife. They're going to get the wow. Elk Pro Success Squad training for two months, and they're going to get our base camp elk hunting course. That's the grand prize, man. Wow. <laughs> that's, <crazy. laughs> that's, that's the grand prize. But get this. It don't, it don't stop there. That's all. F you're in for that just by purchasing the Academy. Absolutely. Exactly. Yes, mm -hmm. sir. Wow. Yep. You purchase the Academy, you are entered to win that package. $75 could win you $35,000 package right there. Which, which what you're getting in the yeah. Academy is just like, it's already underpriced. Oh, oh right. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. 100%. Unbelievable. Yeah. So package number two, it's a three-day South Texas hunt with the boys right there, man, uh, down there chasing pigs. Yes, sir. You don't have to yep. worry about nothing but bringing your sleeping gear, man. You don't even need a license because you can hunt hogs there in Texas without a license. You bring your stuff to hunt with. You bring – hello? Yeah. Mr. Prince? <laughs> no, I'm busy right now. Yeah. We're doing the yeah. – <laughs> 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 you get to hunt with the fellas here, man. Um, down south there, you just show up with your with your gear. Um, all you need is something to sleep with, something to hunt with, and they're going to take care that, of the rest, right? That fellow that fella was phoning to enter. <laughs> 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 there was somebody Luke, calling I'm going to I'm I'm do my very best to have the mafia down there with us, too. So we'll set it up. Uh, dates to be determined, but... Um, for sure, try to have the mafia down there with us, and 
we'll have a big time. Uh, and, taking and you're going to work with day. whoever wins this, right? So they can hunt sometime in the springtime next year, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So they're going to get that. Cool. They're going to get the Western Fly Pack and Optics. They're going to get the Elk Rose Edition Bow Hitch. They're going to get Hoot Camp clothing, camo clothing from Hoot. This is a, a product that's made there in Texas, and it's made for that country, and it's going to be perfect for that pig hunt. Um, they're going to get a Native by Carlton Call Pack, the Slayer Enchantress, and they are going to get the Ultimate Predator hog decoy so maybe oh, that's cool. something mm. with that man and uh they're going to get the outdoor edge razor bone knife and they're going to get the elk bros base camp elk hunting course that's package number wow two, man get this package number three hit or miss archery our archery store here in new mexico showed up all the other archery stores out there Showed up all <laughs> the archery stores out there. <laughs> and they came through with an elite archery basin compound bow for the winner. Wow. Uh, yes. Yep. So we have a bow in package three, along with the Western Fly Pack awesome. Sino covers by Guy. We got the Native by Carlton Call Pack, the Slayer Enchantress Call. We got the Game Changer. Freddie, my man Freddie, gave us the Game Changer CG Call and Hauler. What that is is it's actually you can put the CG Call on for you. It's a different type of system to give you a whole different sound than a regular big grunt tube. You just call through that CG, and it has its own built-in pressure one to make loud, one to be muffled, and it's, I tell you what, that's an ace in the hole when you're trying to change up your sound out there, and they're going to get the Elk Bros Base Camp Elk Hunting course as well. Package number four. Now, I, I saw this, man, and I was like, God dang, which package would I really want if I didn't get that? And the winner of this is going to get an initial ascent IA2K backpack, I mean, that's wow. a seven hundred dollar <laughs> backpack right there. And wow. that's awesome. <laughs> it it is one of the best systems. Um, I run an IA. Uh, it uh, I on this very pack that we have in here, I hitched that puppy up, and I carried a hundred and sixty pounds on that pack, and it didn't feel. I mean, it was amazing how I was able to carry that weight. It's uh, oh, was that what like 20 years ago when you no, do sir, that? No, sir, it was last year, bro. Uh, last year. Oh, I got you. I got you. I got you. I'm just checking I, here. It's like, I, you know, I'm going to carry, carry you and your sweetheart, Manano. Oh, <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> I'm just checking, That's you know. That's awesome. Yeah. Joe had to kill that thing up on the top of this big, tall ridge, man, and I had to come in from the bottom. And I'm like, man, why did he have to kill it up there? Couldn't you let him run a little bit and run down the hill? Oh, my God, that thing was way up there, man. But he did. He carried that last quarter down off of that ridge, and it was it was not easy coming down that last ridge. Yeah, but yeah, just the one the one quarter he carried. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Luis carried all the others. Three of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I think you carried them on your shoulder, didn't you, bro? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, how about yeah. that? It's a good thing that bike was only hundred yards up there. Yeah, <laughs> like hey, like like I like I said, if you come hunt with the mafia and our boys, they ain't leaving nobody behind. I promise you. Now, guys, you heard me say the initial ascent backpack. Well, the winner of that package is going to need that because they are going to have a ticket to attend Dan Staten's Elk Shape Camp. One of those that. Are, take place throughout the United States. And Dan's Elk Shake Camp is unbelievable with some of the top instructors in the elk world. Let me tell you what, this is an incredible opportunity. Go check out the camp, man, and look at what you would pay to attend this, right? Um, you've got the, the Game Changer Killer Combo, the Base Camp Online Elk Hunting Course, and you're going to get the Elk Bro Signature Call Pack that's going to have the grinder and the sugar in it, man. Package number five. Um, and How many packages are there, Joe? There's six, bro. Six. Oh, wow. <laughs> But so as, we get, as we get to five and six, what these are is basically these are transferable. If you're not able to use it, 
you can get you can give these to somebody else the rest of the stuff is not transferable but these are because in package five we have a event pass a two-day event pass to the beast mode archery event that takes place oh, there in wisconsin i think it's the king of the mountain event and i mean that is a 360 dollar package that goes in with that right there and i can't wait to put a price tag on all of this what all of this stuff is is costing together i was i was gonna ask I, that was gonna be my last question is like if you were to add everything that is being given away what would be the monetary value of all of that oh dude i i, I gosh i i'm i'm scared <laughs> to say man because uh i mean we're over 40 grand easy and this stuff so oh yeah oh, i mean yeah. if just the like the grand prize is you're like at thirty four thousand, give or take yeah just the grand price i mean you got five other prices there <laughs> with a bunch of stuff in there so i mean i i, I think you sold yourself <laughs> short there on that one and our our package six well on that package five they're also going to get the elk bros base camp elk hunting course they're going to get our signature call pack and package six is going to be event passed for two people for every competition that takes place and the shoot on the mountain at one of the Western hunt fests this year. And that's a $300 oh. plus package. That's the, that's the shoot. That's the calling competition. That's the pack them out challenge. <laughs> and the one of them, the first one's going to take place right here at the Whittington center in Northern New Mexico. And then the other one in Bailey, Colorado. And it is a incredible super event to really get yourself ready for the season there and they will also get the elk bros base camp elk hunting course and the signature call pack from elk bros as well so that's our six packages man around joe there. this this uh giveaway started about three and a half hours ago correct <laughs> oh, it, it started on it started um last week uh last that would be last thursday on march 16th Okay, and it ends on May 9th. May 9th, absolutely. May 9th, okay. Guys, get out there and get entered. I, I, I just can't tell you how proud I am. First of all, of all of the sponsors that came in yeah. and this happened, mm -hmm. um, get on our website. You'll see the sponsor logos on there. You can click and go visit them and use them because these are incredible people to do something like this. You got to enter to win. <clears throat> Elkbros.com. Give them one more time, Joe. It's at Elk Bros. Just go to elkbros.com. You get on that front page, you're going to see how to enter. It'll just, there'll be a link right there. You'll see giveaway on the front of it, and you just click and go to it. All right. And if you want the exact address, it's elkbros.com slash hunt 2023. Correct. Yeah. We got to get moving. So let's jump over to the Elk Bros mailbox. And Luis, you're going to take the first one, dude. The first one comes from Mr. Jack Hephart. Hephart. Yeah. yeah. From Pennsylvania. Don't ask me to say that name. <laughs> Hootsdale. <laughs> Hootsdale. 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 Hootsdale, Pennsylvania. Uh, he mm -hmm. says, I've been listening to your podcast and I absolutely love listening. I have learned so much. I have been hunting elk for five years now and shot one five by six my first year. And others in our group have had great success. My question is, we have only seen elk where uh, we are hunting in the morning. The latest uh, we've seen them is about 11 a.m. With the great success we have had in the area, should we abandon it for the <clears> afternoon or keep trying uh, that area for the afternoon and even in hunts? Uh, we typically hunt second rifle season in Colorado. <coughs> Any input would be greatly appreciated. <clears throat> Basically, what he's saying is, is that they're hunting an area where they're having a lot of success in the morning, but they're not seeing anything in the afternoon and the evenings. So should they change places? You know, RC, we know that we've had areas where it's been um, some areas are sometimes better morning hunts and some places are better evening hunts, right? Most definitely. They all just like being there at certain times, you know, well, and... and mm -hmm. And, and they got a destination a lot of times that they're going to, you know. And, um, you know, it sounds like the one that they're on hot in the morning might go check a few other areas, see if they're hot in the evening. Just curious about what they ran into as far as uh, the moon, right? you know, animals moving. At, you know, they yeah. don't have to move early because yeah. if they got to move, And I'm curious if they're down in the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. I'm 
curious if they're down in a bottom and the elk are going up in the morning or are they midway up a ridge or I'm curious to where they're finding them, you know. Second rifle season in Colorado. I understand that, but it doesn't say what type of terrain they're hunting. No, no, so, I'm just I'm just making that comment mm-hmm. just to see if if that tips something away as far as like how they're transitioning through the day. I'm assuming there's snow there as well and the snow line the snow well, line may have something to do with it. Yes or no. Um on that second rifle hunt, not necessarily are they having snow right. in there and um I think That's they have four later total, October, huh? Yeah, I think they have four total rifle hunts in there that that they get do. later as they, they do, go. Yeah. Um, the first rifle yeah. hunt is really during the rut, and then the second one is just a little ways after that, towards the beginning yeah. of November, I believe. But uh, and don't quote me on that. I'm just kind of in my head thinking that mm-hmm. way. But the 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 main issue I think a lot of times is is it happens to us on the ranch is that a lot of rifle hunting takes place in places where you can see well. That means, like Gilbert was talking about, people are looking for the bottoms, they're looking for open areas, they're looking for animals on open hillsides and different things like that. And when you're doing that, man, I tell you what, even on a private ranch, it happens to us that once the shooting starts, the now the morning, you can catch them boogers out there and they're getting back to the trees and just depends on what's happening with that. And you can catch them moving on on the sides. But in the evening, a lot of times you're waiting for them to show up. And I'll tell yeah. you, it, it got to the point that we talk about it as guides all the time is the golden half hour or the golden 15 minutes because they don't pop out until right before the end, of 15 minutes before the end of shooting light. Or... They don't come out till after shooting light. Yeah. Yeah. So in that kind of case, I don't think it's necessarily that the elk aren't in the area, but you might have to change your tactic. Like you might have to be actually going into areas, maybe, you know, turning that scope down to 4X and getting in some of those transition areas where there's more open that elk might show up moving through from bedding areas, heading down to those more open areas, but they're actually in areas that you can see them um, by moving through the trees. You might try that, or you might try to find areas that, um, uh, that are that you can look into that, that you can glass some of those sides from another ridge side all the way over, but glassing the trees and not waiting for the bottoms necessarily, you know, um, yeah. That's just some of the 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 things, but yeah, especially if there's a full moon. If it's a full moon, you know, they don't have to pop out into them opens until way after. Till later, yeah. And I mm-hmm. think a lot of it has to do with that, the distance they they're having to travel. Travel, yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> if they're like these elk over here, they, you know, they got like 10, 15 miles that they go before they get all the way to the bottom. You know, so it's yeah. like. What time are they starting? It takes a while yeah. for them to get there. Yeah. yeah. And I yeah, I just I think I think once the shooting starts going and happening, <laughs> yeah. you know, I think those guys change just... uh, number one, I think a lot of them, especially <laughs> in that October period, are going and finding sanctuaries. So I think yeah. in that afternoon, I think you're gonna have to look in places that um, most people aren't. You're going to have to find some places where you're looking down into some real thick stuff, some places that you <laughs> look for a place that you go, man, I would not want to have to haul one out of there. <laughs> That's exactly. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I guarantee you, you're going to find a big bull in there, man. You know, um, but there is ways. I mean, sometimes it seems like the afternoon is a tough thing and the evening is a tough thing, but I would just change, man. I would actually go get into places unless, unless that boogers your mornings up. If if going and getting up in those trees is going in, in RC used to, you know, because I had the bow hunter mindset when I was guiding rifle hunters, you were like, no, leave them boogers alone. Don't go up in there. Let them do what they do because they'll be there in the morning. Right. So yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, and then yeah, they'll pull them out of there. Yeah. yeah, be there and be ready to ambush them. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So yeah. that's you know, you 
you might have that as your morning spot and go see if you can find another evening spot that you can work without messing up your morning hunt. The next one was from, uh, and man, I, Talon Richardson, <laughs> the whole thing about this, he's from Helper, Utah. <laughs> and <laughs> Talon was actually the name that if uh, my oldest daughter, Britt was a boy, I wanted to to name. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That Talon was a, from Helper, Utah. That's pretty cool. He says, Hey guys, love the show. Been listening for a short time now, and I'm just blowing through the episodes. I've been hunting as long as I can remember, including two elk hunts that were unsuccessful, but elk are my focus now. I've hunted deer around the same area. I'll be looking for elk every year. However, they seem to stay on the private property. I've listened and heard you guys say to try and call them off, which I believe we can do. My concern is the line which they need to cross runs right down the top of a ridge. What would you recommend doing to try and get them coming over and get them away from that line? Also, I was wondering when the sugar call would be available to purchase. I bought cotton calls and multiple of the grinder calls, and those grinder calls are sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Also, once again, love the show. I run equipment every day, winter plowing and summer digging holes. And I've been listening to the podcast every day and not only listening, but I bring a grinder call to work and practice calling all day long. Thanks. Man, Talon, thanks for the shout out, brother. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So don't you think the question would be, is he uh, bow hunting or is he rifle hunting? Right. Um, That would be one of the questions. Uh, if no he's, doubt. If he's, if he's talking about calling them off, um, mm-hmm. because I don't know too many people worry about the line with the rifle as much because you can, you know, drop them. Right. Yeah, if he's if he if he's bow hunting, man, I personally I don't worry about the line. You know, uh, you got to get him across that boundary to to even make a decision. So get him across that boundary and try to get him within your your effective killing range. And uh, when you do send it, brother, and, uh, you know, hopefully hopefully they won't try to go back the way they came. I've, I've had that happen, and I've also had them, you know, die within 35 feet of that line. So, I yeah. mean, it is what it is, but I wouldn't let that yeah. affect me one bit. I'd get a couple <laughs> hundred yards off that line and uh, start calling and see if I can pull that booger across that line. And, uh, you know, hopefully within a couple of hundred yards, you know, you can take care of him. Generally, you put a fatal hit on one of them, they ain't going to run more than 100 yards, you know. And, uh, if, yeah, you and I think them, if you watch our if you watch our shot placement uh, podcast, brother, you hit a mare and it ain't going far at all. I, can tell I think you it's more of wondering how to bring him across the line. Right, yeah. I, I think that's what you got to throw your own party. Yeah. Throw your own party. So, I uh, and what Gilbert says, I – when Gilbert, he said a couple of things in it that I hope you heard, though. He said he doesn't worry about the line, but he wants to be a couple hundred yards off of it. So, right. you know, because understand something that when an elk, when an elk comes from a direction and they take a path and they are spooked or they're shot, they're going to turn and go back on the exact same path pretty much that they came in on. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, if you shoot that guy 30 yards off the fence and, and he's got it in him to, to go, he's going right back over that fence onto that private property. So we highly recommend that you be off a few hundred yards off that to try to pull that animal. And, and that doesn't mean that, you know, you can't have somebody down at the bottom of a ridge that you're trying. And it depends. Like in my mind, when I see this area, I see like a heavily treed ridge maybe. Uh, And if it's. has a lot to do with it. Yeah. What's the terrain mm-hmm. like? What's the what's the vegetation like? Um, because number one, if it is a herd bull and it's a morning deal and that herd bull is heading up on that ridge up there, you ain't bringing him back up over that line. But mm-hmm. by putting on a party and sounding like another herd over 250, 300 yards away from that line, you can bring those satellites in. So, mm-hmm. you know, because... A- am I right, Travis? Yeah. My my first thought was when I heard that, I would work my call line right up, you know, pretty close to that line and, mm-hmm. and get them excited and worked up as much as you possibly can and then start down, drawing then back, mm-hmm. you know, move away. draw yourself back and bring them over with you. Yeah, move away and, and just 
pray to God you can bring them with you. But don't slow down your calling. You got to keep it ramped up and you got to keep them excited because once they hit that level, that's the level they got to stay at to come to you. So that's what I was thinking there. Yep. And especially like a, a satellite bull. I've had so many times when I've been calling in that satellite bull because maybe I sound like a bigger bull and he's trying to pull one of my cows off. He stays off 100 yards, 80 yards away from me. And it sound, it seems like that bull's never going to come in. And I keep calling moving away. And doggone, if he doesn't stay that same distance and follow me the whole oh, yeah. time, man. Mm-hmm. So it's a perfect <laughs> opportunity to team slam that guy, right, um, to do that. But what Travis is saying is get where, get where you have the carrot. Get where they can sense that there's another group over there and there's another uh, group of elk that they can get to that's nearby. Yeah. And then start moving yeah. away from that puppy and do just that. Just create a wake and pull them in your wake. Yeah. Yeah. You're gonna know, thank you. Yeah, you're gonna know if that bull has a hot cow. You're not gonna get them away from a hot cow. That's when they're all gonna be just screaming and bugling, and that's when everything's bugling. And that's how you know there's a hot cow. But right. if it's kind of quiet and you portray that you have a hot cow, oh yeah. my goodness, man, like yeah. He's going to come. He's going to come for sure. And not only that, bulls that are further satellite down bull. that ridge to satellite the other bull. sides, they're going to, yep, they're going to suck right in as well. They may put the sneak on to you, but, you know, you you know yeah, they're coming. They'll come in silent. They'll come in silent. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Be ready. That's right. I think one of the things that you have to be careful of, and it, you de- that's where a decoy would definitely come in. Yeah, I was going to say decoy. The simple fact yeah. that that's what the first thing he's going to do is he's going to top out on that ridge. And he's going to be looking. He's going to be trying to see what's what's going on over here. So yep. you definitely got to be aware of that. So yeah. you know. I was going to say be willing to, to, to try different things too if you see that a strategy is not working. Like I, I know, Joe, you, you know, we, we had a similar situation and um, – and and you tried a lot of things, but then ended up going with a lost calf. Right. Um, yeah, you just got to find one to pull them. Right. Yeah. And yeah. the the lost calf brought, you know, another calf that brought another cow. That that cow was being the one that that bull was after, mm-hmm. and uh, it brought everybody back in. You know. So. And that wasn't yeah. a herd bull. I mean, you got to look at that. That was. Not. was- that was a, a single cow with a calf that another satellite was like, Oh yeah, this one's mine. Right. And, yeah. uh, you know, and, and yeah. the time of year that you're talking about, if you're hearing them over on the private property, it's gotta be a little bit later in the season. Mm-hmm. If it's a little bit later in the season, like, like Travis is saying that that bull is going to be cowed up and it's not really like you're trying to pull him. You're going to use his excitement. You're going to listen to other bulls around that are sounding off and you sound like your own group of bulls with a hot cow moving away. Mm-hmm. And that's some lower hanging fruit for him. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, one year, uh, one year Chav and I walked through the middle of a herd of elk, cow calling and bugling. And I mean, literally walked through the middle of a whole bunch of cows and other little spikes and stuff like that. We heard some bulls bugling on another side of some private ground, and we walked that perimeter, walked right through those those elk to get to these other ones, and ended up walking within 12 feet of about six bulls. <laughs> and, I mean, these bulls would walk that perimeter, that, you know, that edge of that ridge, and it, we needed them to come across because we had no shot, but at, especially on the other side, we needed them to come across. And, man, I can't tell you how many times they wanted to leave, but when we got in tight, and I mean super tight, we just would – I'd turn my grunt tube away from me and throw some real soft cow calls and a little soft chuckle. And, man, those bulls couldn't stand it. They had to come back to see what was going on. They're like, that's really close, but we can't really pin it down to where it's at. And finally, one we got one of them's attention enough where two of them kind of got after one another and made the other one jump the fence. He actually poked him in the butt and made him jump it, you know. <laughs> and uh, when that when that happened, it was you know that's all I needed, you know, was to be legal and do the right thing. And uh, 
but we were persistent in sticking around there and, you know, had the wind and, uh, and got in the middle of them and really didn't say too much until they kind of got boogered, you know, and when they got boogered, we tried to settle them down and call them back to us and it worked like a charm and end up, you know, shooting that little five by five. Uh, and he, you know, he didn't run, but about 35, 40 yards. Uh, but at the end of the day, I, you can do it. You just got to be patient and test the water to see how those bulls are feeling, you know. And, and that and, doesn't uh, mean five it, or ten minutes. That, I mean, it could be 45 yeah. minutes, it oh, could it, be an hour. Yeah, oh, my took, God. Yeah, it took a while. And, and uh, there were yeah, times how long, we, how, how long yeah, do you think took, we spent doing that? I don't know. It seemed like a half hour or more, but uh, you know, there were least, times where, yeah. yeah, where they wanted to walk away, but you'd you'd do a soft cow call and they'd come right back, and just kind of linger around, and then wanted yeah. to leave. You'd do a cow call and they'd come back, and then finally, like you said, you know, a couple jumped over and and that was it. That's all. We, that's all you needed. <laughs> yeah, there's man, there's so much. They walk so close to us. I thought they were going to sniff us, man. At one time, they were literally <laughs> twelve feet from us, man. Oh yeah, and, uh, really close. Yeah, and and we <laughs> want we didn't want them that close because the wind was kind of getting jinky on us, you know. And we had the good wind, but as soon as they got <laughs> level with us, it was fixing to be Katie bar the door, and uh, so we got we kind of got lucky. And uh, then my guide, man, the best in the world. Uh, Mr. The Ninja right there, he uh, had my back. And when that sucker jumped the fence, I knew he was in pretty good way. I asked, I asked Chav, I said, I asked Chav, I said, how far is he? He said, seven yards. I said, no way. <laughs> He's <laughs> there. Yards, yeah, I'm like, no way, dude. And I'm, I'm like, I, I thought meant to myself, maybe 45, 50. So I had my 50-yard pin on there, and he goes, no, 56. I'm, and I'm finished, you know, and, uh, and that was it, dude. But yeah, we had some fun. That was an unbelievable trip. But guys. But, but I will tell yeah, you, make, make, yeah, make sure you range it a couple of times because sometimes it's yeah. a false, false reading. <laughs> but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, honestly, dude, honestly, I mean, Gilbert kills this bull, and I mean, this bull drops dead as a doornail within seconds probably 50 yards off this fence line which made me nervous so i mean <laughs> I, I and just the idea that i i didn't want to go through the long night or the long day of having to deal with a you know a private landowner so i would much yeah. rather be a couple hundred yards 200 off. yeah yeah so, don't yeah. do like i did <laughs> don't yeah. do like i did but what it was dang gum say, fun i, I promise you. what were you gonna say travis you were gonna say something well, that's such a cool bull that Talon gets to hunt there because, like, there's so yeah. many different scenarios you can employ in that. I mean, you could simply, if you're a solo hunter and he's not hunting with any buddies, just go up close and start raking a tree. And you guys all know ra ra raking those trees, you're you're pretending you're you're just playing for the cows, and that bull's gonna know what you're doing. But in the other hand, if he's got two or three other buddies with him, maybe they're not great callers, or maybe they are good callers spread spread everybody out you know distance like 70 80 100 yards apart across this ridge now like gilbert was saying start portraying that you're doing your own little party and your different bulls bugling that means there's something going on that cow is hot and yeah. Yeah. i don't know like it's i love that scenario there's so many different tactics you can employ i mean it's that's elk hunting and it's finest form right there that's what yeah, we live not for only, not only that he's saying that he has the fence line running down the top of the ridge so that's actually yeah. that actually helps you to get a bull if you get him to jump that to commit to come down off yeah. the ridge or and and it just depends yeah. on the situation man uh and it's hard because when you tell us something like this, I visualize different things on how that mountain looks as to what it might actually be. But uh, yeah, if it's if it's like on the top of a ridgeline, that's actually sometimes easier to get a bull to commit because they're going to take an angle coming off the side of that, or you know. Yeah. So um, I we absolutely think it can be done. Um, I would like to. Oh no, it can place. be done. Yep, I'd like to be some. I hunt with I hunt with some I hunt with the guys that can do it. That guy's talking to you right there, Joe Gillia. If he's with <laughs> you, he's calling that bull from a half a mile away. He he's will doing put it. him in your lap. He will put him in your lap, 
brother. So uh, you guys, you know, you, again, guys, get in that get a, giveaway because you get to hunt with the one and only Joe Chilia. <laughs> and I promise yeah. you, he will – I have witnessed him call a bull. People say you can't call a bull up a ridge. I promise you they that guy can. And that guy did. And yeah. I did arrow that bull at thirty five yards. We were probably what, two hundred, two hundred yards off off the boundary line, Joe? Yeah. But he died About in ten that seconds. You... That bull died in ten seconds. Yeah. <laughs> It was, it, was, hey, it was over. It, 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 it was unbelievable. <laughs> it was an unbelievable hunt. I promise this, uh, Mister uh, Mister Talon. I promise you, Mister Richardson, you can do it, bud. Just just keep working on your call. That lost cow call, man. It it works wonders on them old old, old lost bulls that are looking yeah. for well, love. And and, and, uh, and and look. When we talk about putting on your own party, that's like when you hear elk over there, it's like a party you're not invited to. You just create your own, and it's not just bugles. Yeah. Use those glunks. You use those, yeah. um, you know, those insistent cow calls. Use those little calf calls yeah. in there. Use the pants, the moans. Yeah. Use those different yeah. things that signify that there's a bull tending, that there's a bull with a hot cow, and you can absolutely pull them over, okay? Yeah. Yes, sir. All right, guys, you know what time it is. Shout it's time out. for the Elk Pro Shout Out. 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 We're going to our show this week. Shout out to our followers in a few cities where the most listeners top of our charts this week, Joe. And you know what? I usually give the good people that have been leaving the review on the Apple podcast, but I'm holding it this time. And the reason I am is Travis came up with a great idea. He said that um, – he thought that for those folks that leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or give us a comment on our YouTube channel and include their name and where they're from, we're going to take and put y'all's names in a hat. We're going to do this once a month, and we're going to draw us a winner, and we're going to send you a Wapiti River call and a signature Elk Bros diaphragm call. So if, if you give us a, a review or you go give us a comment on our YouTube channel, make sure you leave your name and where you're from. That way we can kind of put it out as to who we get and we can get contact info from you if you listen to the show, and then we'll like to send that your way. So great idea, Trav. That's a cool idea. Yeah, awesome. All right. Okay. So, Travis, our first our, – our top listening city – Man, uh, we thought we were going to let you handle this, man. Yeah, this is uh, this is close to home. Literally, it's like four hours from where I live. So uh, this is home to the Trans Alta Leisure Center. Uh, they have a pool, soccer field, gym, gymnasiums, uh, workout gym, the ice rink for the whole region. And it, it's also home to the Heritage Grove Trails where bikers can ride for hours through the lush forest. The name came from the local forest which were dominated by spruce and poplar trees. Pop poplar Grove was already a city. Spruce Grove, Alberta, in Canada. <laughs> so proud of you guys. Awesome. That's awesome. International, Joe. Yeah, man. Wow. Crazy. So our, <laughs> so our brothers and sisters to the north were listening, man, to the top yeah. city, man. They actually, we had more listens there than we had in Denver and Dallas this uh, this last show. So uh, wow, that's I, crazy, I thought that was brother. really cool, man. And and I don't know if it was because Travis was on the last show. But then I was thinking, <laughs> no, that probably scared more away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. No. But you know what's funny? I drove right past there today on my way to Edmonton. So I'm literally oh, wow. in Edmonton, Alberta for the sportsman show. So if you guys That's are in awesome. Spruce Grove, hopefully you guys come out and see us. I know they're going to be hearing this late, but <laughs> I'm yeah, sure they'll be yeah. coming over. Sure. Next up is also close to home for me. Very this city close. is in East Texas, um, <clears throat> was the center for the lumber industry and an agricultural center, mainly tobacco. Outdoor activities are abundant and a big attraction. Nearby, Sam Houston National Forest and Lake Conroe offer a wide variety of outdoor activities. A must-stop culinary attraction is the Pizza Shack. I've never been. I got I to gotta try it out. And this is in Willis, Texas. Willis, yes, Texas. Absolutely. In Willis, Texas. Dang. Awesome. My wife's sister lives in Willis, Texas now, man. And the Pizza right. Shack deal? Pizza Shack's off the chain. Really good. <laughs> really? <I'm> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm 
I'm coming Absolutely. down just for the pizza. I love yeah, it. Yeah, that's I'm, I'm down, man. I I want to check it out now. We'll we'll all meet there. It's, 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For me in my mind, after driving through Texas as much as I do in the areas I do, it's kind of interesting to hear that there was a center for lumber industry there. You know, that's just yeah. but there are a lot well, of people in that area, right? You've not been around East Texas. East Texas is yeah, all pine. I mean, trees. it's just all oh. pine, piney woods, man. Yeah. And the lumber industry is big, but from East Texas through Louisiana, all Louisiana. the way, to, you know, yep. all the way, all the way across the, you know, Arkansas, all the way across Alabama, all the way at Mississippi. That's kind of the the pine tree belt that goes through the United States and yes. East Texas. We call it the East Texas piney woods, and uh, I mean. All the national forests and all are, are all pretty country, uh, very pretty country, beautiful. Country. And the paper land, uh, paper companies own most of that land now. Okay, uh, this town was named after the original farmer of the town site. It is located 16 miles north of Baton Rouge. Former NFL MVP of Super Bowl 22, uh, Doug Williams, was born here. A fire devastated the town in 1903 when a grocer tried to flame ripen bananas and, and this is in zachary louisiana zachary louisiana man zachary, louisiana. Zachary. yeah Fl- flame ripen yep. bananas i'm sorry man i just that just caught my head <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> it <blew> my <laughs> mind too <laughs> that's a little here pretty green i might try that <laughs> <laughs> my wife loves those green ones i'm like no no you want the yellow ones <laughs> All right, next, this next top listing city, this town's known for the Ashen Bar, which claims to be the oldest bar in the state of Oklahoma and famous for its secret recipe of fried chicken. The name is derived using the first letters of Oklahoma, Arapaho, and Cheyenne. And o- o- Okarche, or Okarche, Oklahoma. Okarche or Okarche? Yeah, I'm not sure what that is, man. Or, I would think yeah. it's no car shit. So they took Oklahoma, Arapaho, and Cheyenne to make that. That There you go. <clears throat> Very cool. Hey, uh, well, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Texas, and Alberta, Canada in the house tonight, man. All yeah, of shit. Very cool. You know, man, it's kind of funny. You know, I, um, I'm i trying to do some, some intermittent fasting, and um, – you know, I, I just stop eating kind of like at noon and I don't eat again until next morning. And uh, obviously by this time of the day, I'm super hungry. And all I see here <laughs> is bananas, chicken, fried chicken, pizza, fried chicken, chicken pizza. pizza. What is going on, man? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Go drink some water, man. Exactly. Hey, cooked yeah. bananas are awesome too, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. Main Banana content. Booty. Um, if you listened to last week's show, you got a heck of a show last week. We're going to continue that on becoming an elk hunter. We're going to try to give you the basics. We're going to start off today on the basics of on when to hunt. There's a lot of people right now trying to decide on calendars. Like we do an Elk Bros calendar and we're going to do one with all these specifics and everything like that. But what we're going to do is we're going to simplify it right here. As far as time of season for archery or rifle, maybe even time of day, we can kind of talk that a little bit, but best time when to hunt. So if we had to give people basics, <clears throat> what's first shot at this at what your suggestion would be? Well, I would prefer the early season opening day, but uh, mm-hmm. I'd love to hunt in the rut sometime. <laughs> so, you know, but, okay. in the rut. So, you know, Chav, I was actually going to break that down to two times, when they're the dumbest and when they're the noisiest. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that- that would be it. Yeah. Yeah. Which is what he said. <laughs> yeah. Funny part is what people don't realize about the early season. That's probably one of your best shots at shooting a big bull because those bulls are out there traveling. They're trying to get their, their little harem all, all tied up already. I mean, and they may be bugling, they might not be bugling, but those bulls are traveling. I guarantee They're you searching. they've left their, yep. They've left their bedroom and they are on the hunt. 
I would say opening day in the first three days of the season, opening day in the first three days could be your best three days right there. Um, yeah. It has a tendency and – and bugling. Bulls are – are, are bugling. Yeah. A lot of times you get an early estrus or you got bulls that are, you know, they're still developing their pecking order. And so it's a, actually a great time. And we've always yep. been very su- <clears throat> successful early like that. But yeah. I would definitely say you either go when those elk are the dumbest, when they haven't had learned anything from right, sure. at that time, yeah. or when they're the most yeah. vocal. Right? Yeah. Yeah. 100%. 100%. I've hunted both. I've hunted both, man. I've hunted the early season and I've hunted in the middle of the rut. And I'm telling you, that if you never hunted in the middle of the rut, you need to experience that. It will. It's like your soul's on fire from from mm-hmm. daggum first in the morning till all night. They bugle all stinking night. Will keep you up all night. <laughs> I mean, it is it is mm-hmm. absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> uh, but, I, for me, I really like the early, early season because I feel like you can you have a little bit of an advantage <clears throat> with them not being pressured and mm-hmm. uh, and not have had not have been called several times, right? Um, yeah. But again, I, I I enjoy hunting the first. I enjoy hunting the whole time. I I wish <laughs> I could take off from September first through October twentieth, and I can hunt the full gamut. You know. Um, it's uh it's crazy both but joe's right you know the dumbest and the loudest are yeah. two of the special times to be in the woods and and i actually think so we know that the dumbest is going to be at the beginning of the hunt when they start getting yeah. out i would say anything yeah. the 15th and the 21st they're going to be cranking like that yeah. And then yeah. sometimes you hit that late estrus that's right, depending on what, when your season is, like if you have a season that goes to the 30th, you know, I would definitely yeah. try some of those latest days, and especially during the week on those late days, because a lot of people have put all their eggs in the basket, like us hunting early or then hunting in the front part of it and they get worn out. And a lot of times the competition's out of the woods there late. So it's just. Yeah. That's, that's actually what happens here, Joe, like guys go out, not as many guys go in the early season, uh-huh. but through the mid, like, you know, you're talking September 12th to the like 20, 24th yep. in that area. Yep. They're getting hammered and hammered and hammered. And then all those guys, cause they took that time off work to go. Now they're gone home and now the woods have been yeah. quiet for a whole week. That's some of my favorite hunting is that we're lucky. Like I can hunt into October, November. So the first week of October is Mm. yeah it, here too. It, it, here too. it comes back around you know what happens is those elk are smart through the rut then they have that week of doing nothing they're right back to what you're saying joe they're dumb again and i mean yeah. you just throw a couple little calf calls and they <laughs> they come dropping in buddy and they're there it's yep. like man that was easy now so. now all that other stuff about moon uh for archery i'm gonna tell you for archery <clears throat> It affects rifle. It can affect rifle. But I think rifle, just as soon as guns start going off, affects rifle. But when you're talking archery, archery we don't worry about moon phase. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about uh, that at all. We hunt them whenever. That moon <coughs> phase. Because if we have, yeah. a, if we have a full moon, we're going to go ahead and get on them. And when they're screaming at night, be on them in the morning. You know, if we have a dark moon, that means they're going to be out a little bit longer, maybe come out a little bit earlier. But we're still in the trees anyway, so we really don't care about that. So the basics yeah. on that is when they're the dumbest, when they're the loudest, and kind of give yeah. you those three times, okay? Um, what about time of day, y'all? Here we go. What if there was a way to flatten your elk hunting learning curve and have the experience of a lifetime, gaining decades of elk hunting knowledge and skill sets that'll take your DIY confidence and ability to a whole new level? Look no further. Welcome to Elk Bros Adventures in our coached adventure camp, an elk hunting experience like no other. Your prep and training starts months before you ever step foot on the mountain. 
Our campers have weekly online training sessions with each member of our Elk Grove Success Squad in all aspects of the hunt. Gear, physical condition, archery setup, failure points to avoid, shooting proficiency, finding elk, locating, behavior calling, setup, and closing the deal. From the moment you get to elk camp, the boots on the ground training begins. Each camper will have one of the Elk Rose trained coaches with them throughout the hunt, not guiding, but teaching and helping you to learn and apply those lessons. For the price of what many today are paying for tags alone, you will be smashing that DIY learning curve, becoming a more knowledgeable, capable, effective, confident, and therefore successful DIY elk hunter. Y'all, hunt preparation like no other, a learning experience like no other, an elk hunting adventure like no other. For more information, go to elkbros.com forward slash hunt. That's elkbros.com forward slash hunt. Flattening that learning curve, now there is a way. Well, cheers to the elk bros, huh? Cheers. 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 A great cheers. elk hunt. Yes, sir. All day. All day. There you go. <laughs> all day. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, we a lot of times, a lot of times, we stay out all day. Mm -hmm. They're not a dumb animal. They, I mean, you know, you think about ninety percent of your hunters are going to be out real early, and come ten o'clock, oh, it's time to go eat. So the woods become quiet again. Mm -hmm. Everybody goes to camp, and that's. <clears throat> That's the best time to be there is because the elk are going, oh, they all left. Let's yeah. go play. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah I, I, yeah, I noticed that when I was in the the in the blind when we went to Colorado. You know, all the action yep. was between uh, 10 and 2 o'clock. And yep. that's when yeah. mm -hmm. everybody else is at camp. Yeah. Everybody else was at camp, yeah. Yep. yep. So yep. that, you know, the, the thing is, is uh, people talk about, you know, the pressure in the woods. Well, the best time to hunt is when other people aren't hunting. And that's being on them right at daylight, which means you got to be out there in the dark locating, be on them right at daylight. Mm -hmm. That midday hunt is fantastic on there. And if you're willing um, to get home a little bit later, to get a little bit less sleep, because that's what happens in this, then you can be out there and hunt in those areas uh, uh, until dark. So, um, yeah, you have, and you're going to get caught in the dark if you hunt till legal shooting light there. So, yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and don't get, don't get spun out from, if you run into other people, I can't tell you how many bulls we've taken after running into some fellow hunters and high-fiving them and sending them on their way in 10 seconds, 15 seconds, we're in elk, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, they just, they, they like to be around the party. And when you start doing what elk do and sounding like what elk sound like, they're going to come find you, man. And, uh, <laughs> you're hunting around, you're hunting around some good sign and stuff like that. Just understand, man, as long as y'all are, you know, keeping the wind in your face and doing the right things with your wind, wind adjustments, y'all going to, y'all going to be fine. You hunt all day, you know, especially yeah. in the right, let's say a, a place that you want to hunt going to take you four or five hours to get into you might as well stay all day in there, not come out, you know? Yeah. Carry you a lightweight hammock um, so you don't have to yeah. sleep on the ground. Um, you know, Manano turned uh, turned me on to this, man. You just string that up out there. And, and I'm, look, when I'm hungry, I eat. When I'm tired, I sleep. When I'm thirsty, I drink. Yep. And mm -hmm. you know, I try to live my life in the woods the way the elk do. And if there's a part of the day that I know that that you know that they've bedded down and things have got quiet, I'm gonna catch me some Z's at that time for a little bit. Yep. And man, then I'm gonna get in those areas where I'm liable to hear those bed bugles, and then they're gonna start talking again right there at that midday. Anytime between yep. the time eleven and two o'clock, man, they start you know making that move in midday, right? So. Um, that's, that's some great advice for you right there. Now we're going to move to tactics basics. So basically when I talk about tactics basics, what I'm more is, again, we're <clears throat> talking more archery here and we're going to talk about, you know, what our playbook is when we get, a, you know, we get up and we get into the woods. How, what are our tactics basics? What is our playbook that 
we practice each of us when we go out there just to kind of give that to everybody. And I will say this, um, in talking, you know, cause we are going to Alberta, Canada this year and then talking to Travis and some other things, our tactics in some ways, just like shop placement in some ways might have to have a little bit of change to it. And, and there's a reason for that. And it all comes down to apex predators, but you know, we're just going to keep that on the side list and let's talk about this first. So Travis, I'm going to, your basic playbook, mm. you get off of that bike, off that boat, um, you know, and you get into the woods, what is your basic playbook? What are you going to do? So basically my whole thing is right away, I'm going to be quiet and listen for about a half an hour. <clears throat> Just be patient, throw the patient games right in there. And are you doing that to let things settle down from, you know, you getting there? Yeah, basically letting it settle down, but I don't know what goes on here. Like we can jump off the quad and literally just shut the quad off. And 30 <laughs> seconds later, you can have yeah. a bull bugle. Yeah, exactly. You can have a bull, like me and my buddy, Jason, it happened to us. I doubled Jason in. We, we got off the quad, shut the quad off. We were just standing there, just doing nothing. And all of a sudden there's a bull screaming, coming up the trail at us. I mean, we don't have our bows out of our cases. We don't mm. got our, this is in the dark. Like this bull is coming in in the dark. He's coming to see the noise of the quad, right? <laughs> and we weren't talking or nothing. I hadn't thrown out any cow calf sounds. I haven't chuckled. I didn't do just anything. all the crashing from the vehicle, right? Yep. 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 Absolutely. I, what happened is I pulled off the cut line and I backed into the trees. So it was snapping and cracking all the new trees and stuff. Cause <clears> I like to kind of <throat> hide the quad a little bit. And uh, that bull came just walking right up. But so that's my whole thing is the basics. Even if I've walked into a ridge or something, I like to just sit down and just let everything calm down. And I love just hearing everything going on around the birds, the squirrels, and you hear those distant bugles or a chuckle or a groan just down in front of you. Now you can start to formulate a plan. I mean, for me, that's the basics of everything right there. Just be calm and just, let nature happen if there if there's elk there they're going to tell you okay so yeah. you've gotten off you've listened for a half hour and you haven't heard anything what's your game play play there then i'm getting on my quad and i'm leaving <laughs> <laughs> no 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 no, no. <laughs> there's no elk here we're out here <laughs> there's no elk here they're not yeah. <laughs> exactly no basically from there on um I'm going to literally just throw out, this is one of my secrets. I, I'm going to throw out just a really quiet little chuckle stuff. <laughs> That's all I'm going to do. And it's literally just going to reach the sound out a hundred yards in front of me. And then I'm going to be patient and quiet. And I'm going to sit there for another 15, 20 minutes and Let see what marinate. happens. Let it marinate. And, Sorry and, to and tell you, it's not a secret anymore. It's not a secret no more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's not, you know, it's just, I, I teach everybody this at my seminars and I'll be in Edmonton. I'm doing seminars all weekend. And I tell the same people the same thing over and over. And, you know, it's amazing. The people, they still go out there and they want to fire off that location bugle right off the get-go. And it's just, um, <clears throat> there's a time for that, but there's a time for just, being patient and using really quiet toned down stuff. And, and yeah, that, yeah. that sounds to it, me you know, very similar, Joe, to kind of like, you know, what you had taught us too, as far as just kind of starting, starting at, at lower volume, close cow calls and just slowly progressing out to reaching right. out further distance. Right. I mean, it, it I, just, I, 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 it, I can relate to that. I call it call casting basically yeah. Yeah. because you're, you're yeah. checking areas around you and you want to find everything there. Then you reach a little further, you just cast a little further. And then you, then from there you <clears> cast <throat> a little further and depending yeah. on where you're at and whether <clears throat> or not casting something farther is going to help you because you can be in an area where it's not going to go over a ridge. It's just a few hundred yards off. You're, you, you don't really need to do that at that point in time. You know, you need, yeah. when you're going to cast call far, you want to be someplace where it's going to carry and going to be in that kind of morning air. But you know, what Travis is talking about is those low audibles, you know, this was our conversation because our playbook 
our playbook is a lot like what he's saying. You know, we're going to cow call first and we're going to listen. But, you know, we do the same thing. We get into an area and we just stop and listen, man. You mm -hmm. want to listen to the woods, let the woods calm down, especially if you get off a bike. Your ears are still, you know, ringing from the noise of that quad. Yeah. yeah. ATV. You just want to let all that fade. And, and it's true because Chav and I one time drove our truck in an area in the dark and we, we pulled into a two track that just ended and we were lost in this. We get it out <laughs> and we slam the truck doors and a bull screamed at us from like 40 yards away just because we had made yeah. all the racket, <laughs> which ought to cue you people up to not only just that little light chuckle, <coughs> even some of the raking that's going to go along with it because yep. it's that breaking of the branches and the raking that those bulls are coming to check out, especially in that early season, yeah. especially. Yeah. So yeah. going and, back to your playbook, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and the other thing I'm doing, like to keep it really basic, have your wind checker or have a way that you're checking what the wind currents are doing, you know, I like to be up on top of the ridges. So your, <clears throat> your scent's going to be going down, right? First thing in the morning. And I like to do that because, you know, first we, we crawled out of our sleeping bag. We're still groggy. You walked out there, you know, you're kind of waking up yourself a little bit as well. So it's giving you time to wake up, keep checking the wind, see what it's doing. Um, for the most part, the elk are going to be down below you because here it's, if the one area we hunt, it's all ridges and then it's farm field down below, like three, four miles away. <clears throat> so those elk are feeding out in the fields, but then they're traveling, you know, back up the ridges to, to bed down. So that's kind of what I'm, what I like to do. I like to just take my time, you know, I'll spend a good half an hour, 45 minutes, even an hour. And I might do maybe three or four sets of truck chuckles or rake a tree, something like that. <clears throat> but I'm not in a real big panic. And once I've stayed in that area for, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes, nothing's really happening. <clears throat> I know those elk are still moving up. So you got to give them elk time to move. They don't, don't have a magic line and, oh, bang, all of a sudden they're at the top of the ridge right in front of you. You got to give them time to come up. So that's where I'm, the patient game is such an important thing in, in my thing. And that's just how I hunt. So if nothing's happened after say 45 minutes or you give it an hour, I'll literally bump down that ridge, but our ridge system's kind of, there's a ridge, then there's a little, you go down a hill and you're on a shelf, you go down a hill and you're on a shelf, you go down and you're on another shelf. So I'll literally go from these little shelf to shelf to shelf as I'm working my way down the hill now. And <clears throat> so what happens here mostly, like I say, those elk are coming from the field. They're working their way up the ridge. Once the thermals change about 8, 30, 9 o'clock, your, your scent and your thermals is going down because the air is cooling. Once the thermals, the air warms up, basically, that's what the thermals do. The air is warming up. Now, all of a sudden, that air starts coming back up the hill. Now, your scent and everything is going back up to the ridge where you just came from. That's where the elk are literally going to bed down. That, the minute that those thermals start to change, they're going to be on one of those shelves that I'm working down to. And the minute the thermals change, they're going to stop. And that's where they're bedding down. They work their nose. They're following all, you know, they're going into the thermals as they're working up the ridge. And once it changes, they bed down there. And now they can literally smell if any predators are coming up the hill because that scent's coming up the hill. So they're in their, they're in their little zone now. So if you had to simplify that, if you had to simplify that um, and explain, are, are you telling somebody just to work mid-ridge? you telling somebody to stay on a contour and drop from bench to bench? Um, are they wanting, because you're not wanting to drop down too far. You're wanting to stay in no. there where these boogers are going to bed, right? So, yeah, yeah. So like what my whole goal is, I'm, I'm never in a hurry to get, to the very bottom if it takes me three or four hours to get down there and uh, then it takes me three or four hours mm -hmm. <clears throat> it you know it just you never know where you're going to bump into those elk they're always at a different spot it seems like and not only that the elk that you think you're going to run into you run into different <clears throat> herds on your way down there so it's like all of a sudden holy crap there's a bull like off to your right side 100 yards and he 
he probably came into your sounds, but you didn't even know he was coming. You know, maybe he didn't bugle or anything. So and if I've worked my way down, you know, spend the morning doing it. And now when you where, say down, Travis, when you say down, yep. are you going down the ridge or are you going across ridge? <clears throat> so like a lot of people are going to say, hear that down. So they're going yeah. to, start, and, and what, the reason I say that is, is that a lot of times people will start going down to where they're hearing elk and elk are actually coming up and there's a crossing point where they find themselves down below them and they actually put themselves in a bad scent position right so yeah exactly i I just want to make sure people when they're hearing you say move down you know you're not just dropping straight down the ridge to the bottom no no how are how it's almost like little pillows like pictured as the pillows and you're going from this pillow to this pillow to you know like little small little benches and the, the the ridges don't just go straight across here. It's you'll come to a little ravine, you'll have to cross it, and then you'll be on another there you higher go. spot. Right. Drops mm-hmm. down to another low spot. Um, it's almost like if I if I could uh, another way to explain it to people is kind of like I talk about the knuckles right on the hill. So mm-hmm. you have you have a lot of finger ridges that are happening, and you can actually go up and down through yeah. those ridges and across them at a certain level so that you can actually meet either coming up a ridge or coming through the bottom of those little um, small drainage areas between yep. those between those knuckle ridges that are happening right there. And, yep. you know, not all the way to the top, but not all the way, you know, midway, you know, again, kind of just follow. And, and I think the main, if we're going to simplify this is when you're going up, find the elk trails that are going across and get yep. on them. Because they're going to take you, those trails are going to take you to bench, to bench, to bench. Mm-hmm. They're going to be the same way that the elk are moving. So if I was to yeah. simplify it, you know, is that you're moving through, find those trails that they're using and get on those roads, those trails. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Be on those little trails and mm-hmm. and, they're, and they're not little trails. They're like, they're, they're two feet wide and. And, and deep in the dirt right you, you'll know yeah. it when you're on it it's they're mm. awesome i mean you get on those suckers and you just travel those <laughs> if you're worst. finding fresh droppings if you're finding oh. fresh urine if you find a track yeah. you know you're in the money right yeah yeah <clears throat> there's been times where you gotta you gotta phone a buddy to pick you up down at the bottom somewhere and, and drive <laughs> drive you back up around because you know you get on those trails and if you're like me <clears throat> if you're if you're not getting in Dale, you're following those trails and you're marking on your GPS. Okay, I found a wallow. Okay, th- look at this. There's there's rubs everywhere. Like I'm, yeah. I'm it's it sounds you so. You get excited and you start mapping oh, and you start you exactly. continue to explore and you get carried yeah. away and before you know it, you're just way too far out oh, yeah. there. Yeah, I yeah. Get you. yeah. You're hunting and you're scouting all at the same time. But you know, yeah. to keep it so basic, I mean, yeah, it. it it's literally that easy. Just get on those trails and they're taking you from the little shelf to little shelf. And that's all I can say is just be super, super patient and don't rush it and let, let it happen. Let it unfold. And, and don't be afraid too. like, if you're on a trail and it seems like you're not seeing anything on that trail, it kind of peters out. Well, Mm -hmm. either go up the Ridge or up the, up uh, another contour a little bit. You know, look at look at how that contour runs, and you can try, you can actually see if it's too steep, those elk aren't going to be moving through there. They're just going to drop down off of it. But if it's an area yeah. that kind of levels out in a spot, they're going to work that. So look at the contours. <clears throat> Don't be afraid to go down. Hit another trail. Oh, this one looks better. You know, it's kind of like mining yep. for them. You know, and then follow that follow that trail and to see where it leads and see if it picks up track. And if it goes into yeah. a area, keep your nose, keep your eyes and then really work that man. That's the most basic. If we were to say that yeah. doing that, but you know, Travis, and this is where it's going to be interesting for me versus, mm-hmm. you know, going to Alberta, because when he talks about how he lo- uses those low chuckles, I, I am always a lover before I'm a fighter. So I'm always, you know, working and chumming as I'm moving through an area, I'm chumming with cow calls, right? <clears throat> However, that could be a problem in Alberta, Canada, because, you know, I might yeah. chum up a grizzly bear. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we don't want to chum up no grizzly, bro. 
Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I'm out. I'm out, dude. Whereas that's my game plan. When, when I'm out there and I'm in, you know, same thing, you know, if, as I'm moving through an area, as I'm moving through trails, I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, just a few of those and I'm moving Mm. slow. I'm listening, I'm looking, and I like to throw those out in new areas as I'm moving so that if, and making noise. I don't, I'm not worried about making noise because that's yeah. selling it right there. Right. Um, I might get to a point where, okay, I'm seeing fresh track. I'm seeing fresh droppings, right. I'm starting to smell an elk. Now I'm going to try raking. Now I'm going to try that low chuckle. I'm going to let them know that, you know, I'm not going to do a, a, a bugle per se, because I don't want to let them know what kind of bull I am. And I'm going to give some cow calls. I'm always going to start with cow calls first <clears> and see if I can get that. And then I'm going to mix it up with a, a bull that yeah. they're not able to identify. So yeah, I think staying non-identifiable as a bull is to your advantage. Yeah. Yeah. And one of my favorite things to do is, you know, bring out the little kid in you, pick up a stick off the forest floor and walk with that stick and, swoosh the grass and hit other sticks and you know just you you know it sounds so simple but that gets you elk right there just making those noises with a stick it it's so simple and not only that you got you got a great walking stick and now you can go down and up the hill super easy and you can make noise and you know a lot of my buddies they look at me like man you're making so much noise and why you you you're hitting the dead stuff and it's like (laughs) that's what you got to do (laughs) <laughs> you ever heard an elk walk go through the woods? It ain't real quiet, man. Oh yeah, they, uh, yeah. They can sound like a herd of buffalo coming. Right. Yeah, yeah. I now, did the same thing uh, that you're saying, Joe. Me and uh, me and Dylan were out, and we wanted to per- portray that we were just uh, some calves, and so we we were just doing literally calf calls all morning for like two hours, and we called in this little calf. He came up the ridge. And he was squawking at us. He ended up 20 yards from Dylan for about half an hour. And he called, he just kept doing, I, I shut up after that little calf came. And like, cause we were just calf calling back and forth. We were about 80 yards apart, just a couple little calves. That's all we were doing. And so once that calf came into him, we heard a bull bugle down the ridge. That bull was following that calf. He, and he literally came 11 yards from me and, I went to full draw on them and I just, you know, it wasn't the right time. So I said, you know what, this is your lucky day, little bull. You get to walk away. Nice little five mm-hmm. by five. And it was awesome. You know, a really cool experience and just from the calf calls. Yeah. I, and that's the only thing I would tell you, if I was to give you guys basics in our playbook is that you don't have to go around screaming bugles all the time. You're going to do a no. couple of things. You're going to be a little bit different than regular rodeo. You're not going to be pulling in as many hunters. Um, mm-hmm. And you're not going to be pushing out some smaller class, age class bulls that might come in to check on there. Now, there is a time and a place when sound like a big bull will bring other bulls in. But it, it, whether it's early season or late season. You know what I mean? But I like a lot of those just soft bull noises on that early season with that. Whereas later in the late season, I might do something more with the cow calls and, you know, the more aggressive bulls there. So that's yeah, that's right. The other theory to my stuff, why I like to do a lot of the bull sounds per se, more than anything Uh here, it's a three point or bigger. So they got to have three points on one side before you're allowed to shoot them. If you're doing a lot of cow and calf stuff, and I find you call in a lot of the spikers and a lot of two, two pointers and, you know, the, the little three points that you're not sure is he illegal three point or is he not? Right. Right. But the minute you change it and you start doing more of the bull stuff, you're calling the five by fives and the five by sixes and the sixes. It seems like it switches almost, you know? So I yep. was fooled. I was fooled. Did. Yeah, I was fooled. Me and Dylan got fooled by that five by five because he followed that calf in. But I mean, that's a, probably a very rare time that that's going to happen. Probably a, a spiker is going to be following that calf next time. So, yeah, kind of keep that, you know, a little tidbit in your hat. It's like you, Gilbert, you, you're catching little fish. You're probably moving yeah, somewhere else. You're moving, you're going to get into the bigger fish. You know, it's exactly. that's, ex, you know, it's, nature's nature it's the same no matter what 
Yeah, he, he yep. does that when he goes fishing with uh, his friends. <laughs> Doesn't invite. <laughs> <him>. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. T- <laughs> today awesome. we're today we're catching bait, fellas. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So so let's move on to the next one. What do we have up next, guys? Okay. Response basics. What is that? Response basics. All right. So what are we talking about with response basics? What we're talking about with response basics is, and and what I find is a lot of people, um, a lot of hunters, when they do get a response from an elk, they don't know what to do with that. They're like the proverbial dog chasing the car. They don't know <laughs> yeah. what to do with it once they've caught it there, man. And, and I can tell you in almost – so many situations, unless you have a bull that's screaming and then he's screaming closer and then he's screaming closer. But if you hear that bugle far off, you know, in that distance, man, the first thing that, that I generally am going to do in most cases, there are some cases that you don't want most of them. I'm cutting the distance. A lot of people will just stay put and then they just start call into that animal, trying to bring that animal into them at a distance. And what I Depending like to, on how far that sound is, though. Correct. Yes. Mm-hmm. I want to get as mm-hmm. I want to get as close to that bull as possible. Yeah. I want to get yeah. as close. But to that If it's bull too as close, you might have to set up right where you're at. <laughs> well, that's what we call an yeah. "oh crap" moment, right? Yeah. Oh crap! Yeah. Yeah. What yeah. happened to me? That's what happened to me in Manana, Colorado. I mean, yeah, he was just right there. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I agree with you, Joe. Uh, Joe. I mean, uh, you, what we've learned from you is that too. It's like, you know, the moment you hear something, oh, you want to, you want to understand your wind and then make yeah. your approach and try to get as close as possible. Obviously you got to understand the topography as well too. If it's too far out, you know, what is the wind doing and how long is it, get, it going to take me to get there? And what's my topography, my vegetation looking like, you know, to kind of draft a quick plan. But yeah, it's, uh, yeah, so I was just let's, thinking let's... through that. I was just thinking through that because when you were talking about that, the bugle is like, man, how awesome is it when you just got out there, you started hunting, been a year. And then you hear that first first bugle response is like, your eyes just get this big, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. it's so much fun. So, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. But it, I I think if I was to take it, now, if if you're like in a bottom and you're calling, and all of a sudden a bull screams at the top of the ridge that had mm-hmm. to have topped out because he's coming and looking for you, that's a whole different situation, right? right. There. Right yeah. now, I'm actually taking a look at where his possible approach, where my setup it is, where I can best put myself in a position so that I have a tight setup. Yeah. Do I have time yeah. for that? What's the wind doing? Right, I have to read all that stuff. I all this stuff is swirling through my head. But if it's a situation where we get a response from an a- animal out there, I simplify it to: we're going to cut the distance, we're going to get the wind right, and we're going to get on that contour. So we want to get on the same level. We want to get in the a good wind situation, and we want to get as close as possible. Once we do that, and hopefully that bull, while we're doing that, has also sounded off again, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of technical stuff we can do as far as talking to people about how to read their distance and how far the bull is and how far to go and whether you count steps. There's a lot of things there. But if we were to break it down basic, when you hear that animal, you want to close a distance, downwind side, get to the level. Now, and, and the reason I tell you this is because I know a lot of people that will hear a bull respond to them. And this is the morning, right? right. It's the morning. The bull has responded and then the bull's moved up. So they move up still behind the bull and they call and the bull screams back at him and it sounds all aggressive. And they're like, oh, he's coming in. And then again, he sounds further away. It's because, you know, yeah, th- think of what I'm talking they, about here. They need to mm-hmm. know what kind of response they got, though, Joe. Absolutely. They need to know what kind, what kind of, was that a roundup bugle he just threw? Because if it was, we know we ain't chasing him down because he's pushing them cows, right? So yeah. you, you know real well 
what response you got. So I think you boil it down to the basics is, okay, what kind of response did I get? But but I'm going to keep it even more basic than that, Gilbert, because I'm going to keep it for these people that are just learning and they're overwhelmed. And I tell them <laughs> this, look, if that bull is sounding off up there, if you were to haul up to the downwind side and get on that animal's same contour, you're already putting yourself in better position. You right better be in door. shape. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Now, the thing is about getting on the downwind side of him on the same contour, hopefully, you know, you can almost angle, and as you're moving up, things are going to get a little bit closer, you know, as you're doing. Yeah. And it depends yeah. on the terrain, on what it's doing, right? Oxygen is going to lack. <laughs> yeah. Muscles yeah. and yeah. legs I, I are going to hurt. <laughs> I would much rather try to get on the downwind side, same contour, than chase behind that bull, all right? Is is what I'm I know saying. It. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. We we did that, Joe, with your bull um, in New Mexico a few years ago. Um, we did it why. with the bull. That, we did it this year with a bull. He called in for me. We got below him and had to haul butt across a big open field in, in a little trenoff. And then once we got behind him, <laughs> we had to cut. We had to cut up around <laughs> him and on the downwind side and run up the side of this mountain. And uh, we actually got on the same contour level as him. He was slightly above us. He was slightly above us, but we got between him and the cows and didn't even know we'd done it. And that's kind of what boogered the whole thing. Joe called the cows to us while he was coming down to us. And uh, the cows actually sniffed Joe on the elbow. And uh, that was it, man. She didn't like the like way Joe smelled. He must have had some of Manano's shower curtain perfume on, and uh, she, blew out, she blew out of there like a daggum Roman candle now, and uh, took, took the giant bull with her. Now, if it was the evening, that would be a different deal. Yeah. If that bull's not running away and that bull's coming down, it's a different deal. Right. And that bull mm -hmm. is sounding off to me. Now I'm not necessarily having to close the gap real hard like that. Right. I can actually relax listen to what's going on because mm -hmm. that animal's playing to me, not going away from me. You know, if I'm, if I'm down lower than that, or he's actually coming to my level, we've just switched off. of. Him. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 No. And the other thing is, you know, while you're moving in on that bull, you're, you're listening and you're listening for him to sound off again. You know, did he bugle from that same area or has that, has he moved? You know, because you're yeah. going to, you're moving, you're going to know if he, okay, all of a sudden he's way over to the left. You know, those bulls have the same bugle. If you're paying attention, you're going to, you're going to recognize. And, and well, yeah. now different things happen, right? Yep. Yeah. Now when you're moving in on that bull, you better be having your eyes on your head on a swivel. Cause a mm -hmm. lot of these satellite bulls will come in silent from different angles that you're moving up on. So, I mean, yeah. I saw it. I, well, I just about ran over a bull to get to a bull that Joe's wanting me to kill, and he's calling to, and that bull never said a word. I, I bail off down there and about run over a big six-by-six six to get to the bull I killed. And uh, <laughs> he, was, he was standing there the whole time. Uh, so, again, you got to be real careful when you're running up in there uh, and, and easing up in there and keep your head on a swivel because a lot of these other bulls won't say a word. You well, know, ask yourself, yeah. you know, what, what time of day, yeah. is it, right? If it's yeah. a morning yeah. and they're going to bed or are they coming from bed? If they're going to bed, they're looking to go lay down. They're going to get in a place. And even if you continue to cut that distance, get on that downwind side, and you're able just to stay where you can hear them where they do bed down, now you have a captured audience for the next six hours. Right. So, right. you know, if you continue just to stay behind them thinking that bull's coming to you and then all of a sudden they're 300 yards further and the next thing you know you're losing them over a ridge and you don't know where they go you know so that's where i tell you man that's where i try to keep it basic nine uh, i won't say nine times out of ten but eight times out of ten you know you really need to cut that distance and get up onto that same level on the downwind side so um that's yep, the yep. best way to handle a response of a distant one now mm -hmm. if again if you got one that is close and you hear that bull, man, you got to change. You're, you're not really, your response is not now to really 
having to chase them down. They're most likely coming to you. So now your response is, I got to think about my best situation for a setup. Yeah. Yeah. First, first step, check the wind. What does the wind do? Absolutely. And, and you got to get the wind right instantly, hundred percent right now. And then the game can continue on. Yep. Yeah. Wind ain't right. We ain't going. Wind ain't no. right. We ain't going. Yeah. We're going to let him bugle his, his full head off up there and we're going to wait till the wind gets right. You yeah. know, uh, don't go in there and try to push in there and then blow him out of there and you'll never be able to hunt him, you know? Um, exactly. Yeah. Got to, got to use the wind and, and then again, spend some time understanding what these elk are saying. I know it's basic, but you can get Paul Medell's elk nut app and, and really understand the language of what yeah. response you got, which can help you tailor to what you need to do. Yeah. yeah. And, and to add into that, Gilbert, also, like if it's early season, like this is going to be, cause you just heard your first bugle. Dang man. Like you can't just rush in there like a bull charging through. Cause you, you right. scare those, you scare those boogers off and you might spend the next five days. Oh man. Like where are the elk? Like you can't find them anywhere. Yeah. And that's, so, an interesting, yeah. now, that's an interesting you, thing that we talk yeah. about with Luis is knowing when to speed up and slow down, right? Yeah. Understanding <clears throat> where you are in your placement to where the elk are as well, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially here, that that's your whole morning hunt. You get on that one elk. That's that's your deal. I mean, uh, you might not get another chance at another bull. That so. could be your whole week. <laughs> I'm sure could be. be. Yeah. I'm sure could be, buddy. Oh yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So that that's Great just kind of work. again, that's basics, guys. We're giving you basics right. here. So there are yeah. so many nuances to what we do and we're we're talking oh, about man. Parts, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as we go. So let's go to closing the deal basics. And uh, and what I want to do here is like, uh, and Chab, I'm going to probably come to you first in, in talking about setups, because you've been in a lot of situations and a lot of things. What are the things that when you're setting up, what are the things that you're doing that you're checking for? What's some of your your basics on your setup? Well, you know, be aware of the area that you're at, you know, and uh, when you do set up, make sure you have some shooting lanes. And, uh, you know, depending on, on uh, I guess, if you have a caller behind you, um, I, the main thing is, you know, be aware of what's happening. You know, be aware of what is taking place as far as the what whatever the bull is calling or, you know, what type of sounds is he making. Uh, of course, always be aware of the wind, you know, when you set up, you know, it's probably the main factor, but, you know, got to have some shooting lanes or it's not going to happen. Shooting lane. Now, when you said awareness around you, what did you mean by that? Well, uh, make sure it's something behind you to break up your, your silhouette, okay. you know, for one, for one thing. And, uh, yeah, if you have a cover, not behind cover. Yeah. Behind cover. Right. Yeah. And make sure, yeah, make sure you don't have something in front of you. And, uh, you know, yeah. when I was able to move around a lot, I, I would uh, also look at the ground cover and, and see if I could kneel down and, and actually move around from yeah. the kneeling position. Yeah. Uh, what's that, Luis? What do you, what, what's all that mean, Luis? <laughs> oh, yeah. Make sure you don't. Because people can't see you. <laughs> no, I, I know. I just kind of, you know, uh, alluding to, what has happened to me in the past too is like you get set up and then you know you sit you sit with good cover in the back like you know you kind of get on your knees in front of a tree mm -hmm. and then you know have good back cover and then you you know the you got a good shooting lane everything is good mm -hmm. and then you get to draw and it turns out that you break a branch when you draw because there's <laughs> oh. you know there's something behind you when you move you you know <laughs> you make a noise so it's just kind of <clears throat> Make sure you check your surroundings to, and you know you can you give yourself enough room to where you can silently draw and make that movement, that final movement without so, making. So what much... do you do when you get in your setup and you get down on your knees? What do you do to ensure immediately, that? immediately just kind of scan bones. and then break break all the stuff. You're gonna make noise, 
but that's mm -hmm. fine. Elk make noise when they walk. So when you're getting set up, just break all of that and make sure that you give yourself room. Clear the stuff on the floor too that is kind of noisy. Like if it's kind yeah. of corn flaky to where you're going to make a lot of noise, clear it, clear <laughs> that up and then try to do that before the elk comes in because then at that point you don't want to be pinpointed, especially if you have a collar back. You don't want the noise to did the elk to pinpoint your sound where you at? You want them to be concentrated to whoever's calling behind you. So, so we've heard shooting lanes in the setup. We've heard area awareness as far as where those sh shooting lanes are. <laughs> I almost messed up there. Where those shooting lanes are, in you know, in comparison to what the animals mm -hmm. doing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you talked about area awareness of you know mock drawing to check that you're able to draw and turn in different areas yeah. so you can do that yeah clearing the area around your feet or your knees so that you can able to to move there what else about area awareness what else are you checking to make sure of what what i'm doing i'm doing like louise is saying i'm clearing the area around my feet i like to i, I like to like a two-foot circle into the dirt but i'm also checking the wind at the same time that i'm doing that doing multiple things at the same time and then you know where the elk should be coming. Like Chav was saying, like he's, he's set up on hundreds and hundreds of elk. So he's planting his feet where he thinks the elk are going to be coming from. you got to get in that position so you're ready to draw and actually have that shot. So multiple things all at once. So yeah, I, I think what you're commenting on the wind, well, what you're commenting on the, on the wind is very important because, you know, yeah, you've made it that far, but then that wind may be kind of shifting. And 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 you, if the elk is coming and you're getting a shot opportunity, and you feel like that elk is going to get into where that wind is going, you, gotta make you may have a limited time, um, yeah. you know, actually to take that shot. And then yeah, and then I think Beto, you were about to mention something on, <clears throat> like if you got time map your distances to where you're not needing to range when the animal comes in. So you kind of give yourself reference points. So that, that's where I'm talking about area awareness. Really so good. When, when we're doing that, we're, we're checking our own bodily area of awareness. We're checking where our shooting lanes area awareness. We're checking where um, distances out by hitting the range right away so that we have that right. Okay. And, I want to know where 40 yards in is. If, if I can know where 40 yards is, Rest is lanyap for me. I just need to yeah. know where 40 is at. And that's that's kind of my deal. Once I know they're inside of 40, I got them. You know, uh, mm -hmm. I can pretty well guess when they're 20 and 30 uh, if I know where 40 is. And uh, in, in past 40 now, I'd really – really got to know the range when you're shooting out past those distances. Well, generally, mm -hmm. it's mm – -hmm. That the farther away an animal is, the more time you're going to have to range them, right? So if they're further sometimes, out. some sometimes Joe, but they're rolling up on you, could be rolling up on you quick, and you don't, and you'd be caught with that range finder up in your eyeball, and they're in your lap, you know, mm -hmm. and now you can't move because they're looking at you. Well, uh, I, I, I think know somebody saying, that that happened to. <laughs> yeah, but what I'm saying, Gil, is like if you've ranged your forty and in, you know that. So if they're rolling up, you're good there. But what if they're lingering out there broadside feeding at 55 or 60 yeah. or whatever yeah, well, i want to know i want to know how far that is but if now you have there time to range broadside. right yeah definitely yeah definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah and but i ain't shooting that animal unless i know the range right well, there's a lot of guys that'll pull yeah. up and let it rip and then they you know they're sad because they wounded a bull or they missed but they really didn't know what range it is yeah. guys don't take a shot if you don't know how far it is I mean, just because they're big don't mean that they're hittable. You know, I mean, you got to know your your distances. It's important, you know. And uh, we use our range finders a lot. But for me, I use it to find what 40 is, you know. Yeah. And uh, look, if I don't have Brendan and RC over my shoulder in Colorado, I don't kill that bull. I, maybe. I mean, I had him for 50 and he was 53. I, I got a pretty good shot at killing him. But at the end of the day, that was just solidifying. Same thing with Chav telling me that bull's 57. I mean, I, I would have never been able to make that shot if I didn't know that distance, you know? I so, think, so, mm -hmm. go ahead. I think real quick, I think Travis also alluded to something that is important when he talked about, you know, positioning yourself. You know, we, we have a tendency as humans to kind of position ourselves frontal to, um, to the animal. 
And then what happens then at that point is when you get to draw, you're now drawing mm-hmm. and trying to turn and trying to get yourself oriented to that shot. So, I mean, just trying to get yourself perpendicular uh, or parallel, I guess, to the animal. I'm not, yeah, you know, I'm just, mm-hmm. just, just, just yeah. Yeah, 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 perpendicular a little bit, like to where you can draw straight without having to do much movement on your torso, right? But, but, I mean, that's important. Yeah. yeah, and to that and to that point too, uh, being aware of the wind, uh, you'll have an idea which way the elk is going to try and circle around you to catch your scent. Exactly. Right? So yeah, it kind of gives you an idea. Yeah, you got an aggressive bull. He could come straight in. Yeah, like he could come in on a string like a lot of them do. But like Chav's saying, <clears throat> he he might just circle downwind just that little bit. Now you better have your shooting lanes, like Chav's saying, downwind and have not one shooting lane. Try to get two or three if you can. And if he does circle, you, you still got him. So if, if again, keeping everything to basic rules for these people, you know, as they do, we want in our setup, we want to be in front of cover. We want to have shooting lanes. We want to be cleared around our feet and our upper body to be able to shoot. We want to be prepared for the most, if we're a right-hand shooter, we want to have our body prepared for the most right side shot because you can stay in form turning to the left easier than you can stay in form turning to the right, you know, the way, the way you do that. Right. Okay. And we absolutely knowing where the wind is and not that in, because we can have wind that goes to an angle, but we got to know where that scent line is so that if, you know, we got to take a shot at that bull. We do it before they hit that scent line, right? Absolutely. So, yeah. 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 So that's simplifying our setup. Area awareness around us, our distances, right? Okay. So that's our basics right there. All right. Yeah. Now we've seen the animal. The animal is coming in. So now we got to think about some other types of things. Like most people are going, when do I draw? You know, mm-hmm. Um you know, what the shot focus is, you know, and most of them don't even think about how to stop the animal. Right. But let's talk about drawing. All right. Everybody says, when should I draw? When he's in the kill zone, when he's in the kill zone, draw your bow, draw your bow. Unless if he boogers boogers cow call, he'll stop. Unless you have a situation where you see horns coming over the hill to an area where, you know, they're going to, you know what I mean? where you can pull back ahead of time to be yeah. able to. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, but don't, mean, worry, don't worry about him seeing you draw on your bow. If he's in the kill mm-hmm. zone, draw your bow, man. Mm-hmm. Because if you don't draw, he's going to walk right out of your life. So, you I'm, know, you know and, and, I know that works for us here, but I'm curious as how that's how they're going to react in Alberta because of grizzly bears. I'm real curious on, on that. So, so what I, I – I go off what Gilbert's saying there exactly. And I love to, I love to let the bull watch me draw. It sounds <laughs> so silly. It, it doesn't make sense. Right. But when, when they catch that little bit of movement, they stop it, and turn. it forces them to react and they're going to stop and they're going to turn and look at Broad what side. that movement was. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. And you're look, you're drawing and you're putting that pin on them at the exact same time in the kill zone. You're not just, you're not the, the your pin's not waving all over the whole elk. You're drawing, and you're going on that kill zone, right? So yeah, it's a purpose. Yeah, don't don't draw with the elk's head goes behind the tree, because when you draw, he's gonna see that movement. He's gonna stop, and when he stops, mm-hmm. his head will be the only thing sticking out behind the tree, and the yeah. tree will cover the vitals. Let him get mm-hmm. past the tree and draw yeah. your bow. I'm so yeah. proud of you you're, guys, you're man. Stuff. That's so good. Yeah, I was going to say, Gilbert, so that is good. such a good tip right there. I mean, that yeah. is, a lot of people would do that, and uh, it's such a good tip. Yeah. 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 Look, tip. Let, him, let him clear that tree. I'm going to tell you right now, I, just about every bull that I've shot, Joe or somebody's covered me in a bugle, but they've been looking right at me. I mean, yeah. you know, they're they're like, Man, what is that? What what is going on right there? You know, and uh, and and generally, if you need to stop the bull, get that sugar call or that grinder call in your mouth, and just a little bit of, like that, or even a soft cow call, it'll stop them. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And when they turn and look, you better have your pin settled in that area you want it to go, 
and then send it, brother. That's the close of the deal, man. Get about yeah. six inches, six inches behind that crease mid body and let it eat. And you'll be celebrating over big antlers and, and lots of elk backstrap, baby. Yeah. It, see, in most cases, like I love what Gilbert's saying there, 100%. In the shooter's position, when that bull is coming into your shooting lane and clearing for a shot, it now becomes the shooter's job to stop that bull. You have to become the caller. Right. You can't rely yeah. on your buddy right. that's six, mm-hmm. you know, your buddy sixty yards behind you. He he doesn't know when he's coming into your lane. It's, <laughs> it's, it's your job. You're the you're the caller. You're the shooter, and after the shot, you're the stopper. You have to stop yeah. that bull and calm him back down. One of the big so advantages of gotta, diaphragms. hundred oh, percent. Absolutely. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. I I would say the most important purpose and time of a diaphragm call is those last 30 seconds right there. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. To stop that bull, being able to pop that bull and then be able to confuse that bull. Right? Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. You have, you have 10 seconds after the shot mm-hmm. to make him yeah. stop and do what you want. And yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, guys, what we're going to do is um, we're going Mm -hmm. to stop this at that point right there. Um, On our next show, we're going to finish up with Becoming an Elk Hunter Series Basics. We might introduce a new topic at that point as well, depending on how much more we're going to do this. If you have any questions on basics that you haven't heard from us, send in uh, an email, send in a you know, uh, a message through our, through our um, Elk Bros, info at elkbros.com. Send us something through that, and we'll try to get everything for you to help you be comfortable. <laughs> we're, we're doing, man, guys, you guys have just been awesome, man, um, covering these basics for these guys. It's just super. Yeah. Incredible content it's so for fun. our listeners out there, Joe. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, Travis, good luck on your show. Uh, yep. I'm gonna sell out yeah. all your elk calls, but don't sell too many because we're gonna need some, brother. <laughs> we, got, uh, <laughs> we got you covered, bro. <laughs> yeah. Guys, if you like what we're doing, please subscribe, rate, and review us. You got to go to Apple Podcasts or iTunes to review us, and you can check out more elk hunting content at elkbros.com. And a reminder: if any of our listeners out there would like their questions answered on our show, just send your questions to info at elkbros.com. That's I-N-F-O at elkbros.com. And guys, get in on the giveaway. It's going to be epic. You will not want to miss that at elkbros.com. Uh, adventures, uh, what is it, give, uh, hunt 2023, Joe? Is that right? Yeah, so elkbros.com slash hunt 2023. Fantastic. And like we say here in the Lone Star State, Husbands, kiss your wives. Wives, kiss your husbands. Hug your babies. Keep your broad head sharp and your powder dry. And we'll see y'all next week right here on Blue Collar Health Honey. Yes, sir. Great show, everybody. (laughs) Yeah, super. And for all our grinders out there, here's some more music from our brother, Tony Wintrip. So close out our show. Peace, peace. Peace, fellas. Later, dude. I got a whole bag of tricks. For five by fives and six by six Whether there's snow or a bit of rain All that mountainous terrain I got a pair of boots that fit just right And Phelps calls get them close to my sight When I pull the string and I watch that carbon hit I just elk it Man, I just elk it I just elk it I waited 350 days. I watched the wind blowing from my old ways. And I watched the path that he walked in the fall. And there's no failure in my head when all I'm tracking is red. With the fist pumped to the sky when the beast is dead. I just elk it. Oh man, I just elk it. I just elk it. Like a-
a baseball bat. His body's as big as a rodeo bull. I'm a cowboy on his back. I slip the buck knife under his skin. I quarter him up with a big old grin. And I feel the pack with the gold that I'm gonna be eating. I just elk it. Oh man, I just elk it. I just elk it. This rack is turning heads upside down. The cooler's on and he's gonna start chilling on down, down, down. I just elk it. Man, I just elk it. Oh, I just elk it. Come on.